Welcome to today's live. So what I'd like to talk about today are business waivers. Okay, I'll go into some detail what they are, when you need them, and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, after we'll do the usual question and answer, although you can certainly log on, put your questions here, and then what will happen is once I'm done with my little spiel on business waivers, then, we, <clears throat> then we'll be able to go forward and answer any questions you might have. Okay, so first of all, when someone comes here on a business, um, there's all kinds of non-immigrant visas that they can come on. Okay, um, I mean, there's, there's, for example, the E-2, which is an investment type visa, uh, you know, that usually requires 50000 to 100000 to start your own business or to buy a business that's in all, already in operation. There's the L-1, okay, that's when you have a business that's already happening in the foreign country and you're going to open a branch office here in the U.S., and the actual amount of, of uh, investment is a lot less with that one. Usually, you know, 20000 10000 uh, It's not, it's not a, a critical part of the L1 itself. Um, there's also, of course, uh, you know, typical H1Bs, which are specialty occupation visas. That's where, uh, you know, someone comes in and they are sponsored to work for a company uh, that requires the use of their degree. There's O1s, which are, you know, extraordinary ability aliens. Now, uh, I know that sounds intimidating, but, you know, there, there's ways of, of getting that approved and, you know, different burdens of proof, whether you're, for example, an artist, uh, an athlete, or for business, or for science, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, there's B1, you know, as in when you get a B1, B2, the B2 is to have fun, the B1 is uh, for business and then if you're on a visa waiver uh, you know there's the uh, the WT and the WB so all, all these different things so what I'm trying to show is that there's a multitude of different ways you can come in for business in the US but you have to be admissible okay if you're not admissible you're not coming in it doesn't matter if you want to start an E2 and you have $300,000 burning in your pack pocket ready to start a new business, they're not going to let you in if you're inadmissible. So what does inadmissible mean? Well, the U.S. immigration law has tons of grounds of inadmissibility. You know, for example, admitting to using drugs, using drugs, selling drugs, uh, committing various crimes, theft crimes, assault, domestic violence, okay, all kinds of criminal history. Uh, you know, if you possibly are going to be a public charge, if you have medical uh, transmission issues and you're inadmissible based on that. So you can see that, you know, and I, I'm just going over a few, that there's a lot of reasons you might be inadmissible. So the question is, what can you do to get a waiver of that inadmissibility so that you can come in on the business visa and do your business, okay? So let me give you the code number uh, just so you know. It's 212D3, okay, 212D3. Um, that's a non-immigrant waiver. That's the reference to a non-immigrant waiver. And what that means is that anybody coming in for any reason on the non-immigrant business waiver can apply and hopefully get it if they're not a security risk to the United States. Okay, so it's wide open. Now, don't get me wrong. It being wide open to apply for it and it being approved are two completely different things, okay? It's not easy to get a business waiver approved. Um, but if you're inadmissible, you're inadmissible. And if you want to come into the U.S., you got to get the waiver approved. It is the door 
to getting inside the United States. It's more important almost than the actual immigration petition that you want for business, okay? Because you can have a fantastic, you know, business plan and all kinds of stuff, but it won't matter if you don't get it waived. So what does waived mean? Well, just what it says. If you're inadmissible and you submit all this, these reasons why, and, and just so you know, when my firm does a non-immigrant waiver, it's the attorney cover letter, declarations, affidavits, all kinds of exhibits, evidence, all kinds of stuff, and everyone's different. Okay, I mean, I have people who, who call me and they go, uh, can, you, can you just tell me what to do for a non-immigrant waiver? <laughs> or is it just form this or just form that? Okay, uh, obviously there is a very big difference um, with how it's presented and how it's approved. Okay, you have to look at it like a scale. You have the bad stuff on one side. And you have the good stuff on the other side. Now, the bad stuff, whatever reason you were inadmissible, crimes, misrepresentation, fraud, you know, some medical reason, whatever it is. Um, and then you have everything else you can pile on the other side, which is the good side. OK, so that's where the the uh, scale comes in and you just pile on the good stuff. So the reason a non-immigrant business waiver is so important is because. Sometimes you're so inadmissible, you don't even qualify for the green card, even if you're married to a U.S. citizen, okay? Let's say you're convicted of an aggravated felony 25 years ago, and let's say you've completely turned your life around, you've done everything you need to do to, you know, become a good person again, uh, but immigration's immigration, and you're still inadmissible, okay, as an aggravated felon. So sometimes when there are no other ways for these people to get in, I let them know what non-immigrant visas they might qualify for, even, for example, if they're married to a U.S. citizen, and then they can try to do the non-immigrant waiver, and then they have to come here and they have to stay as a non-immigrant, but at least they get to come here. And that's what's great about the E-2. If you come from a country that has a treaty with the U.S. and you are permanently inadmissible. And we're talking for a non-immigrant waiver. You could have been deported, two illegal re-entries, have crimes, all that. Um, as long as you're not a security risk to the United States, you can, you can do it. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, if you have multiple illegal re-entries, if you have a lot of misrepresentations and fraud, if you have a deportation order, if you have all of that, you know, it's an uphill battle because then you have more on the bad side uh, that you really have to get more on the good side, okay? So the way it works is when you apply for the non-immigrant visa, you go to the appointment and then they'll determine at some point whether to approve it or not. They will take the non-immigrant waiver there, but they never decide right there. They don't say yes, they don't say no. They say, okay, hasta la vista, and then you leave and you'll hear back some other time. Now, the officer will then discuss it with their supervisor. It'll go through the whole procedure, and ultimately, they'll agree whether to give you the non-immigrant business waiver so you can come into the United States, okay? So hopefully, hopefully that all makes sense. That, in a nutshell, is what the non-immigrant business waivers are, okay? Um, you know, and if you're coming as a green card holder uh, or trying to get the green card on an employment-based visa and you're trying to get a visa or a, a, a waiver for that, that's going to be tough because for permanent residency, generally, and, and there's exceptions, but generally to get a waiver, you have to have a qualifying relative, which is a, you know, like a lawful permanent resident or U.S. citizen spouse and so forth. So the question would then be, if you have a lawful permanent resident or U.S. citizen spouse, why wouldn't you be doing a family petition instead of the employment petition? Okay, um, so primarily what I'm referring to is the non-immigrant waivers for business people, you know, B2, E2, O1, H1B, H2B, H3, you know, we, we can go on, all kinds. Okay, so that 
that's that. So let me um, let me scroll back to the beginning here, and then I'll go through and I'll just see if uh, there's any questions. Okay, uh, if there are, I'll whoops whoops. I, I, if there are, I will answer them and let you know. Uh, how's everybody doing today? By the way, um, hope it's all good. Uh, just so you know. Um, okay, so there's there's one question. This isn't really a question. It's more of a statement. It says, you visa update. Um, well, you're going to have to wait a long time. Uh, as you know, the U visa is for people who have uh, been a victim of crime and they want to get uh, the U visa sort of as a benefit because they are a victim. And the sad part about it, I don't know another country that would, that would fall into this. The sad part about it is the U.S. issues 10,000 U visas a year. You'd think that would be more than enough, right? I mean, how many non-immigrants or people who are not citizens are going to get, be victims of crime? 10,000 should be plenty, right? Well, it turns out it's not. It turns out the 10,000 is not nearly enough. And what's happened over the years is it's backlogged year after year after year. There's literally people now that are waiting, for example, 10 years for the backlog to come uh, current so that they can get their U visa. There's ways you can do what's called a bona fide determination as to the validity of the U and get you know, a temporary work permit and so forth. But uh, the U itself is taking uh, a very long time. You might see if you qualify for something else. Okay, I don't know what you were a victim of, but I've had a few U visas where instead of doing U, we did T. And T is for trafficking. And it's not just sex trafficking. It could be trafficking in work, you know, obviously trafficking in sex. And there are all kinds of ways that we can prove that. And there's no backlog on the T like there is with the U. And they only issue 500 T's a year, 500, and those never get used up, okay? A lot of people just don't know about the, the T. All right, what else we have? Okay, I uploaded PDFs that were more than five pages long, but less than 12 megabytes. Would that be okay for the 131F? Well, this is very specific to what USCIS will allow. Um... It doesn't really matter that it's more than five pages. Uh, it, it's a little unclear what amount of, of uh, pages or what the contents are. There's some people who think, I mean, to answer your question, yes, that should be okay. But there's some people, a lot of people, even, even green lawyers, that's lawyers who just became lawyers, they think by filling the packet with a bunch of stuff and putting in tons of exhibits and tons of documents that there's a better, better chance of success. And that's not true, okay? A lot of it's just junk. It actually makes your case weaker because the first thing that adjudicator thinks is, well, they're putting all this fluff in there because they don't have the real stuff. So narrow it down. Give them just what is going to make your case. Don't give them junk, okay? So there's my tip for you for today, all right? Uh, let's see what else we have. I'm just scrolling up. Okay, let's see. Just trying to get to the questions here. Let's see if we have any. Okay, hi, attorney. After the I-360 VAWA was approved, how long does it take for adjustment of status? Okay, well, there's some issues with that. OK, um, first of all, you have to understand just because the I-360 was approved and, and just so everybody knows, when someone is a victim of uh, domestic abuse by a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, but usually a spouse, but it could, it could also be the child. OK, VAWA also applies if the child's been abused. Um, they're able to file for the green card in a special way that will allow them to ultimately obtain residency. So to answer your question, first of all, there's no automatic guarantee that you qualify for adjustment just because you have the I-360 approved, okay? In fact, 
there's actually a way, and the, the, the fact you're asking this shows either whoever you did it or, or you weren't sure about it. There's actually a way to file the I-360 VAWA petition and the adjustment at exactly the same time, okay? Um, and the, the risk with that is if the I-360 is denied, uh, then, of course, you paid all the fees for the adjustment, and that'll be denied also. But the I-360, uh, if it's approved, um, they don't take your your admissibility. And since, you know, we started with business waivers and admissibility, they don't take that into consideration, okay? Um, with a VAWA, you, of course, have to prove all kinds of stuff that, you know, you were a victim of violence, that you entered into the marriage to a U.S. citizen or resident, that it was a bona fide marriage and so forth. But let's say you're inadmissible because you committed some crime. Or let's say you can't adjust because, for example, uh, you were deported or you entered illegally or you entered illegally twice or you committed misrepresentation or fraud. So there's all kinds of reasons you might not qualify to adjust status. I would need to have considerably more information to determine that. If, if you have the 360 approved and you qualify, you can file tomorrow. And it'll take, if everything goes through smoothly, it'll take six months to a year. Okay. Um, but you have to make sure you qualify for adjustment. And if you do, or if you don't, if you're inadmissible for some reason, just like I was talking about the business waiver, see if there are waivers you might qualify for uh, in order to go. Understand that getting the I-360 approved doesn't make all your grounds of inadmissibility disappear. However, there is one fairly decent exception. If one of the, if the ground of inadmissibility is related to the VAWA, to the abuse, uh, then certainly that can be waived. So for example, let's say that your U.S. citizen spouse and you were in Mexico and your U.S. citizen spouse started beating you and say, you're going to help bring my sister across the border and you're going to pretend that you're a U.S. citizen and that you've lived with her and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so you go to the border and you lie up and down you're a U.S. citizen and you say exactly what, you know, your abusive spouse said to say and then everybody gets in, okay, and then they later find out. Well, because that was part of the abuse, uh, that can easily be waived. Okay, does that make sense? Alrighty. Let's see what else we have. Uh, okay. Um, I'm only going to be on for a little bit more, but everybody show some love and give me some hearts, okay? <laughs> it's always nice. See the numbers, okay. Um, all right. So, you know, more on this. Okay, so this is another uh, I-360, but it's a different person. Um, the I-360, thanks for the hearts, everybody. The, the I-360 was approved. The asylum was denied. Can you apply for the green card? Well, that all depends, okay? I, I mean, I hate to not just say yes or no, but it, it depends. Um, why was the asylum denied? Was the case administratively closed? Did you get withholding of removal in lieu of it or Convention Against Torture uh, Protection? After it was denied, were you ordered removed? Were you, were you given voluntary departure and then you didn't leave when you're supposed to and now you have a deportation order? Okay, so I, I see that you put withholding of removal. So that means you didn't qualify for asylum or you filed it a year late, whatever. Um, what you have to do is you have to get back into immigration court because the immigration court has jurisdiction over your case. See, and you're giving me conflicting things right now. You're, you're, you're saying you have a deportation order, but you have withholding of removal. Okay, I assume you're saying withholding of removal. So withholding of removal, if that's what you got, means you don't have a deportation order. Okay, um, but it does mean that the immigration court retains jurisdiction over the case. So if you have an I-360 approved and you qualify, um, you need to make a motion in court uh, to see, number one, if they'll reopen it so you can apply in court, or number two, if they'll agree to administratively close the case, thereby transferring jurisdiction back to USCIS. Okay, 
So how long does the 212 waiver process take? Okay, well, number one, don't, rev don't worry about only how long it takes. People who are worried about only how long it takes think for sure that they're going to get the approval. And and with immigration, you can never be sure you'll get approval. You could walk into an interview on a marriage petition with someone who you have 13 kids with and have you known 15 years, and they're still going to think you're lying about the bona fides of the marriage. So don't ever think because you file something, it's going to be approved. And when you're talking about a waiver, that's purely discretionary. That's very difficult to get. So if you did it yourself, you should have an attorney supplement it to make it a lot better. I mean, you may think it's super excellent, but the reality is when people do it themselves without an attorney, um, I, I, I'm just being truthful here, about 85% of it is unneeded, irrelevant, has nothing to do with the waiver itself. And the part that does is not made strong enough to you know, convince the officer. Given I said that, um, it does also matter jurisdictionally when and where you're filing the 212 um, because people could be outside the U.S., people could be inside the U.S., it depends. Um, but on average, especially if you're in the U.S., um, it's normally taken about a year, okay? All right, on this one, how long uh, does admin review take? Well, there's a problem with that. Um, whenever it goes into administrative review, um, many, many times you can equate administrative review with black hole, okay? Um, when I get clients that tell me that, the first thing I find out is how long has it been in administrative review? Because I assume you've called immigration and they're nice, you know, you wait online for an hour, but they're nice and they'll tell you that they're working on it and they'll get back with you. They're going to say that no matter what. They, I'm sure they don't even have your file in front of them. They just want you to get off the line. So that, that's not helpful to call them. Okay, that, that's the reality. And so administrative review is immigration's way of, you know, for the most part, saying they're not doing anything. They're sitting on it. So if enough time has passed much more than would be normal for your particular case, then we have to sue immigration. We have to do what's called a writ of mandate or writ of mandamus, where we actually sue them and we show that it's taken way too long to do what they should have done, you know, in a week, let alone a year. Um, I can tell you 99% of the writ of mandates that I've filed end up resolving before I ever stand in front of the judge because the U.S. attorney doesn't want to go in front of the judge and say, oh, your honor, I realize we have this 50-page petition. I realize it's been three years, um, but we need just a little more time to review it to make sure it's okay. I mean, they're not going to go with a straight face in front of the judge and say that. So they will try to settle as soon as they can. So one thing for sure, I don't take a writ of mandate. I won't file unless I'm sure you have a good case, a winner case. If there's questions as to the validity of your case, then, well, uh, you know, writ of mandate's not for you because that just forces them to make a decision. It doesn't force them to say yes. But for example, if you have a, a straight fiancé case, you know, let's say you're doing a K-1, and let's say the guy's name came up for one reason or another, but there's no record, nothing showing an admissibility of any kind, you know, no showing on a terrorist list or whatever, um, red and mandate may very well be the thing you need to give leverage to make the decision, okay? All right. Um, I-730 approved. I have an old removal order. All right, well, if that's the case, you have an old removal order, but it doesn't just magically get removed, Okay. Um, there's ways of, uh, I mean, I don't want to exactly say getting around it, but there's ways of resolving it so that you can move forward, uh, get the removal order so it no longer legally exists, and then go for it, okay? So, but I need to have more information on your case so you can call my office. Okay, hello, I got an RFE. That's a request for evidence. And what that means is that 
whatever this guy submitted or this lady submitted, um, they said basically, sorry, you didn't prove any, everything. We're not going to deny it, but we're not going to prove it. We want you to answer these following questions and give us, you know, whatever documents. Um, so can I upload my evidence on my U.S. CIS account or mail it in? Okay, well, first of all, I would not upload it uh, because you're never going to get proof they got it. All they're going to say is, well, we never got it. You know, the upload didn't work or if it did work, you didn't properly notify us or you didn't notify the, the proper one. Uh, by the way, the phone number to my office, 562-495-0554. Okay, again, 562-495-0554. Um, so when you send it in, don't do regular mail. Okay. I mean, first of all, obviously you need to prepare a good RFE. You know, if you if you send in a junk RFE answer, what's the use? It'll just be denied. But assuming it's a good RFE answer, um, positively, 100% mail it in. But you have to do, uh, you know, I always use UPS or FedEx uh, with signature required. Signature required. Because I guarantee you, you could send it in, it could go there, you could have done everything right, and yet they're going to say, sorry, we never got it. You know, it might have gotten the mailroom with 600,000 other pieces of evidence, but we never got it. Tough luck. Okay, so you, you send it in, you pay the extra $3 for the signature, and what happens is they get, the, of course, the signature, uh, the time, the name, and all that. And when they say, we never got it, you go, well, I beg to differ. I have a card here that says at 2.38 p.m., so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so signed for it and said, now, unless that so-and-so is an imposter and hopped into USCIS and pretended to be an, uh, you know, the intake person, you got it, okay? And then, then you're all good to go, okay? So that's that. Um, okay, can you please answer my question? Um, okay, this is from Stobel. I'm not ignoring you. I think I passed your question. Sometimes when I uh, scroll, it, it like auto scrolls past 50 different things and I don't really know that. So let me just scroll up a little bit. If I happen to miss your question, you can just send me an email with the question. Um, okay, I'm looking for Strobo. I don't see you yet. You can always repeat your question so that at the bottom when I get there again, I might be able to see it. Oh, here we go. Uh, well, I have one. Okay, I applied. Here we go. I applied for the I-45 based on Granite Asylum. USC sent me an RFE. Well, this is a good segue, right? Y'all know what an RFE is because I just told you. Um, I haven't gotten it in the mail yet, but I submitted everything. What may they want? Well, you know, we can play, you know, crystal ball all you want here. I have no idea what they want. Um... You know, if, if you were granted asylum, then they're not going to question that, okay? They're not going to say, well, we know your asylum was granted, but, you know, we don't believe that you were really persecuted and this and that. We want you to send in some more evidence. Now, it's not going to be that. It's going to be because you either don't qualify to adjust, which, which you might not. I mean, again, this whole, this whole section here is on business, it started at business waivers, so you might be inadmissible, okay? Just because you were granted asylum doesn't mean it erases all grounds of inadmiss inadmissibility. It does mean that getting a waiver is easier, okay? It, it's definitely easier to get a waiver of inadmissibility as an asylee than it is of many other areas, but you still have to do it. Now, I know you say that you submitted everything, but that's in your mind, in your mind, you submitted everything. But if you don't know what you didn't submit, you can't, you can't just say you submitted everything. So first I would determine whether or not you are actually qualified to adjust. Okay? I'd need to ensure that you were actually granted asylum. I'd need to make sure you waited a year. Okay? I mean, you might have filed the asylum application 360 days after you were granted asylum, and then you don't qualify because it hasn't been a year. So there could be a whole bunch of reasons why. So just wait for the RFE, and then you have 84 days to answer it. Then make sure it's properly answered, okay? You're going to drive yourself crazy if you try to f f wonder why they did it, uh, you know, without knowing. Although, to be honest, 
I could give you a consultation and probably in uh, 30 seconds I, I would be able to know why they issued it, more or less, okay? I mean, it's not that I'm psychic, it's that, you know, I, I would ask the question to see about qualification and admissibility, okay? So, let's, I wonder if I missed uh, other questions up here when I scrolled up a bunch. Well, let's see, let me just scroll down. Okay, just a minute. Okay, I think I got most of them. Um, what is this for? Well, if you're talking about this, I'm an immigration attorney. I have three decades of experience, certified specialist in immigration nationality law. And believe it or not, when I want to relax, <laughs> uh, I can get on live and I can relax, okay? Um, believe it or not. And, and I like answering questions. You know, it's kind of neat. Um, so that's that. Uh, okay, Mr. King. Is a waiver still needed if a person who was deported more than 20 years ago and completed the 10 years bar? Okay. Well, the answer is yes and no, okay? If you're talking about a deportation waiver and it was clearly a 10-year bar, okay, because sometimes, for example, if you're an aggravated felon, the waiver's for life, the deportation waiver. Um, so assuming that you're correct that it was for 10 years, then you don't need a, a waiver for the deportation. However, again, just because the 10 years has passed, might not make the other grounds of inadmissibility disappear. Okay, so let, let's say, for example, that you were deported because you came into the U.S. on a fake green card and it was fraud. And they found out you went through all your proceedings and you were deported. And now, 10 years, you know, 20 years later, you want to come back. Well, the underlying ground reason for the deportation, which is fraud, that still exists. You do need a waiver for the fraud, even though 10 years has passed. So don't confuse the time of the deportation bar, which, you know, by the way, there's ways to get rid of that a lot sooner. I mean, theoretically, you could have filed for it, you know, three days after you were deported. But there's also the underlying ground of inadmissibility that needs the waiver, okay? All right, what happens if you age out once an admin review and medical exam expires? Well, okay, and first of all, you say there's a 26-year-old dependent. Um, first of all, I can't imagine it's been an administrative review since this person was under 21, okay? Um, that means, at a minimum, that whatever you have filed has taken at least five years and as you can see, administrative review in your case would certainly be a black hole. Um, if I were to take the case, and I, I would have, you know, before the person would have aged out, I would have made the various motions to expedite it. I would have shown the urgency, okay? You can't just sit on it when they say admin review, okay? They may as well say that they put it in a bottle and stuck it in the back of the fridge, okay? So... I would first need to determine, minus the admin review, if in fact there is a chance of uh, obtaining whatever it is that needs to be done. I mean, the medical exam expiring is easy. That's just getting another one, okay? The age out is a major issue, and I would need to see if in fact there's qualification. Okay, so you call, call my office. Okay, just a second, as usual. Okay have my oath ceremony tomorrow, but I got arrested and charged for a felony three days ago. That's not a good thing, okay? You can't go to your oath ceremony. No way. Um, it's off, okay? Uh, you can either let them know or whatever, but you cannot go, um, especially because you're most likely also going to have to sign that there's been no change, and if you sign knowing this, um, you now will also have fraud on your record, so you can't go. What's more important to you is now that you're for sure a green card holder um, and you were charged with a felony, uh, you obviously need a criminal attorney, but you also need an immigration attorney. And essentially what my office does is we do criminal uh, evaluations. Okay, We work directly with the criminal attorney because they, they may be experts in criminal law, but they don't know anything about immigration law. Um, and they might give you a deal that they think is a deal, but it's not. So... 
forget about naturalization for now um, and get a criminal attorney and, you know, you can call my office if you want. I'll let you know what it'll take. You have to have an immigra uh, immigration attorney too. You know, 95% of people who um, uh, go to court, they, they plead guilty. And you can certainly not plead anything without the advice of an immigration attorney. Okay, my lawyer requested multiple evidence from my wife for an I-130 marriage, but only thing they, well, either you wrote more or it cut it off. Um, I'm assuming, oh, there you go, it's the second one, sorry. Submitted was one affidavit. All I sent him was bank statements, multiple affidavits, lease, whatever. Okay, well, they're trying to show that the marriage was bona fide. What does that mean? Okay. The bottom line is it means that the marriage was entered into for love, not for the green card. That, that's the bottom line. I mean, it could certainly be a legal marriage, but not be a bona fide marriage under immigration law. So the lawyer has to present the evidence in a manner that shows that you're married for love. Okay. I mean, I can exaggerate and say, well, you knew each other three days before you got married and you're 25 years age difference apart and you don't live together and you don't have no joint documents. Okay. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but obviously something like that shows it wasn't bona fide. Okay. And then I could go the other way and say, you knew each other for 20 years. You have 12 kids. Uh, you live together and all this and that. Um, and that's clearly bona fide. So you're in between, I'm sure. Okay. So you need to, to make sure it's not a matter of how much evidence. It's a matter of the quality of the evidence. Never confuse the two. Okay to show the bona fides of the marriage. Should I be worried? Well, you might be, okay? But I would need to know, I would need to know if, in fact, you know, you you, you have a, in my estimation, have a bona fide marriage. If I would determine that, you know, I'd put together the coherent argument. There might only be one thing from the other side, but uh, generally there's more. Um, you know, but that, that's what you really have to show, okay? Um, you applied 17, oh, you applied 17 years ago for an F4. Well, an F4 is a sibling petition. I don't even know if you're correct saying it's an administrative review. For example, if you were from the Philippines and you applied for an F4, which is brother, sister, you'd be waiting 25 years for the visa number to become current. Okay. That has nothing to do with administrative review. That has to do with waiting for the visa number to become current. And so that's, that more or less is what's happening. It is very unlikely that on an F4, if the, especially if the visa number is not current and the person's 26 or you're 26, no way that person's going to benefit from an F4. Not a chance. Okay, that person needs to stop wasting their time and find other ways to immigrate. Okay, that, that's the reality. Okay. All righty. Well. I think that's going to uh, close up today's live. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, go ahead and, you know, if you have follow-up questions, just go ahead and, and you know, email me or, or set up a consultation with my office. Um, let me answer this last question here. It says, hello, uh, I don't know if this is on topic, but I was just wondering if children on H4... Uh, could get an EAD. Um, the answer to that is most of the time would be no. Um, the only time a spouse normally gets the EAD is if you're you've been on H one B long enough, and for example, on the sixth year, uh, you can prove that you have an I one forty or a labor certification that's been pending for at least a year, and then you get yearly increments on the H one B. If it falls in that case uh, and the child, meaning one that is old enough to legally work, is on age four, if it falls within what I just said, there should be no reason that that person cannot get a work permit, okay? Um, but that's not normally the case, so I, I would have to inquire with you, okay? All right. Well, everybody have a good day. Thanks for listening. And until the next live, okay?